Mondays with the Mako. We are back with you. Guys, thanks for uh, a bit of the feedback over the last few as I took the break. You guys were encouraging me to get back going with the content. Uh, the content is serious. It's obviously time consuming and I take it um, with, with a, a bit of passion. So uh, thanks for allowing me to get a bit of a break, but encouraging me to get back in action with this material. And I'm really excited to have this new lineup for group two. Uh, we're going to start today with Townsend. Uh, we're going to go next week with Trish Elliott talking about some Arizona real estate, specifically the East Valley. Um, but I'm excited to get Townsend back with us because we were cut off last time. His battery died right when we were talking about uh, the 92 and 96 Olympics, more specifically the 96 Summer Olympics and uh, his silver medal. Um, he almost had won the gold. So Townsend, brother, thank you for getting back with us today, uh, talking about that. And then we're going to talk about property management. How are you doing? I'm doing well, man. Thanks for having me back, man. I appreciate it. This time, uh, my battery's got full charge, so we're good to go. <laughs> awesome, town. Thanks for hanging again. And let's talk right, right back to 92 and 96. As you transition from 92 into the 96 games, what did you learn from the 92 experience that helped you prepare for um, a couple major battles? I mean, you knocked off the defending uh, Olympian and the gold medalist in the silver or the semifinals, and then you yeah. went on to, to face the Russian in the gold medal games. What did you learn in 92 that helped you through all that? Yeah, you know, in uh, in 92, that was uh, my first world team was 91, you know, and so I had a chance to represent the United States there, and then I, I represented the United States in the Olympic Games in 92, and, and it was a tremendous experience. You, you want to tell yourself that you're ready to win like a medal, you know, but I, I know looking back that uh, I was in no, no way, shape, or form ready, I, I think, to actually be an Olympic gold medalist at that time because uh, some of the athletes that I was competing against were some really quality uh, type individuals, you know. And so I, I learned a tremendous amount about, about competing, about being able to uh, peak perform, um, and, and just all around uh, just becoming a, a much better athlete, I think. So 92 was, a, was an advantage to have been able to compete in an Olympics before, you know, that the, the 96 when I actually, you know, won a medal. But I took that, that all of that experience that I had and just tried to uh, focus really hard on just trying to win a medal the second time around. So most people don't make one Olympic team, much less uh, two. So all of it was a tremendous honor. Tell me a little bit about the, uh, the the battle with the Armenian. He was the defending Olympian. You had knocked him off, and then you you went on. How was that 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 battle and that bout? Yeah, that was a tremendous uh, to to have beaten that uh, world champ. He was world championship world champion in '95, and uh, he beat me earlier in the tournament. And um, yeah, just being able to step on the mat with some of those best athletes in the world, I think, was, was again, it's a tremendous honor. And so he had uh, a unique style. I, I focused on just kind of shutting him down. And 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 uh, when the opportunity came, I was able to explode on him, and, and it really surprised him, and uh, ended up uh, turning him, and and um, you know put the match uh, beyond his reach and so having uh, having beaten him that put me on the, on the podium for uh, you know for the a chance to win an Olympic medal against the against the Russian in the finals when you won that match what what was preparation like going into the the gold medal match tell me a little bit about what that energy was like what you were experiencing and feeling what what you did really yeah what well, all happens in like uh, in the span of about a couple of days and so when you uh, when you know you're, you're making it into the finals after the semi match, you pretty much have like half a day, you know, to, to prepare for the finals. And so I think the rules change a little bit different now. But um, at that time, I just went back to, to the uh, with the Olympic um, Village and just tried to rest, just tried to, um, you know, get ready for, you know, the finals match. Of course, everything's ripping through your head and stuff. It's really hard to, to you know, be focused. But um, I just tried to relax as much as I could and just try to get ready for that finals match and, and just did the best I possibly could. The Russian that I competed against, he was a very accomplished wrestler, you know, he he actually beat me a couple times before. I beat him once in the Goodwill Games in St. Petersburg in 1994 in the finals. Actually, won a play of the day, I think, with that with that match. But um, yeah, he was just a tremendous athlete, really good competitor, really good at what he does. I mean, some of those Russians. I mean, this this is their their lifeblood, right? So we here in the United States are amateur. We like to think of ourselves as amateur athletes that compete in the Olympics. And in other parts of the world, like Russia, you know, their athletes are pretty much professionals. Their governments and, and their institutions take care of them, and that, that becomes like their livelihood. And so that's kind of what we're up against, you know. And so he definitely was somebody that had, had been doing this for a you know a long period of time. And so I was honored to have been able to compete with him. Yeah, and he, he more than competed with him. You actually had him on the ropes, and, and I had a strong statement in our first video about about the gold medal match. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, Townsend, you know, I I appreciate that that energy. I was a, a senior in high school that summer. I had graduated. I remember I remember 
um, that, that Olympics very well. Tell me a little bit about um, what happened after the Olympics in 96, uh, after you had won the silver. Um, what was going through maybe your mind and, and what were you doing afterwards? Did you do any touring, talking about your experience or, or traveling with the, sure. the rest of the organization? Well, yeah, you know, as, uh, again, we're athletes who are, who are amateurs, not necessarily professionals. And so to, to continue on with your livelihood, you know, I do a lot of speaking engagements. I did a lot of wrestling camps, sold T-shirts and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, we talked a little bit about how it was kind of bittersweet, really, you know, because you, you just got through from representing the United States, having a, an Olympic medal. You know, like I said, you know, not very many people even make an Olympic team, much less win a medal or make two Olympic teams. So it was a tremendous honor. But, you know, when you're competing for the gold and your life is just all about trying to win that gold medal, and I came that close and, and, and lost that match. And for six months, Shark, I, I had a lot of sleepless nights. You know, it was, it was really tough for me to try to get over that. I think and you can't help but to rehash, you know, if I would have done this, should have, could have done that. You know, things would have been different if, if I only would have, should have, could have, would you know, you know, so... All those things were kind of going through my head for, for a long time. I remember it, it just took me a long time to get over it. But again, you know, looking back now, it was a tremendous honor. And I'm, I'm very appreciative to have done the things that I've done and, and um, you know, and have gone down in history. I think was one of the one of the people that was fortunate enough to have represented their country and, and came home with the medal. You know, you never take that away. Yeah, no, tremendous. You did that twice, Town. You had a great run for, I mean, geez, eight years. Incredible. Um, and then, I mean, before that, as you competed in, like you said, the Goodwill Games, um, it, 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 amazing. Tell me about the, the travels, like you, you had mentioned before, um, in, in some conversations with me, that like to Russia, representing the U.S. and some other countries, having kind of seen the globe, so to speak. Talk about that. Yeah, the things. Great, great question. I think um, you know it really made me um, uh, kind of a patriot, so to speak. You know, my father was in the military for 28 years. And, uh, you know, I, I was really close to joining the military if I did make it into college, didn't find a career in, in wrestling and stuff, you know. But having traveled around the globe and, and to other parts of the world, you know, where like me and my wife talk about how, you know, she would get off the plane in, in, in China or, I'd, you know, arrive in Moscow or something. And, and uh, you know, you're greeted with the Uzi or somebody who just didn't care about where you came from or, or they might even be looking at your passport upside down because, you know, life is just different in other parts of the world, you know. But it really made me kind of um, appreciate what we have here in the United States and and uh, and just really being uh, patriotic because, you know, when you're in some of those other parts of the world and, and the, you know, the, the, the crowd is really rooting against you and you can feel the energy for, for the other competitors, man, it just makes you just really be proud of being a, being an American citizen and being part from, you know, the United States and, and having to, uh, to the opportunity to really represent your country. You know, we take for granted a lot of the things that we have here in this, in this country and and oftentimes you might be upset with uh, the systems and the way they are, but I think, you know, people just traveled around the globe and saw how other parts of the world really is, you know, you, you might think a little bit differently. Yeah, I agree. And I've had a chance to do that recently and I understand what that is. Tell me a little bit, Townsend, about um, life after being an Olympic wrestler. I know that you dabbled with the UFC a little bit and you kept your professional fighting and, 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 and that, that, um, that training going. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, that was a great experience too. You know, uh, the UFC is like it's, it's, it's kind of blown up now, right? But um, man, back in the day, there it was just kind of getting up off the ground, and it was almost like taboo. You know, I think uh, I remember you know, a lot of senators and, and politicians were really kind of fighting against it, and, and it seemed like the whole world was against. It. The boxing commission was was really against it. You know, and and now it's a lot more mainstream. So when I was competing, I was kind of like a pioneer, I guess, because I came on just before they uh, started, just around the time that they started uh, divvying up the different weight classes. And they were looking. They were looking for, you know, competitors from different disciplines. Um, you know, if you're, who, who, you know, at the top of their game. And so they they tapped me and asked me to, you know, participate in some of those competitions and stuff. And so it was, a, it was a great experience. You know, I look at some of those athletes now, and I have no desire <laughs> to want to jump in the ring with, with some of those guys. I see how bad they're getting beat up and stuff. You know, and so they really have involved as, as competitors and, and as athletes and stuff. And so I was glad to have been part of that early on before us. Uh, guys would really get beat up you know <laughs> <laughs> i understand that townsend do you enjoy the sport you watch it a little bit still i yeah i love watching it now and, and I, I certainly always root for the wrestlers you know because obviously that's my background and stuff i think it's much easier to teach a you know a grappler or a wrestler to strike than it is to teach a, a striker to uh to be able to uh you know come out of a scramble on top of, of most of those situations that's what wrestling is really about you know you, you're, you're mixing it up with somebody and, and it usually fights will end up on the ground 
and, and you have an advantage if you're on top, you know, laying punches down on somebody versus just trying to fight from off the back. Not to say that a lot of those disciplines have a lot of offense and a lot of uh, dangerous positions for me on their back, but I think they would even rather be uh, up on top of somebody rather than underneath them. Street fights, bar fights, everyday fights, how often do they go to the ground, Townsend, in your experience, in your opinion, and what you've seen? I uh, probably really couldn't tell you, you know, because I don't get into any street fights or, or uh, bar fights, but I would imagine, yeah, a lot of them do go to the ground, and, and uh, you know, uh, who knows, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm let me, not part let of me restate time. that. Let me restate that, because I, I know you're not a law enforcement agent or a bouncer at a bar, and I know you're not, you're not frequenting bars a lot, but from your experience, how important is wrestling if it was going to go to a fight in, in, in a real scenario? I mean, it's going to be a wrestling match in a lot of ways, isn't it? Yeah, sure. You know, um, I, I think it certainly is an advantage, but with sharks, you know, we talk, and not, not to say there's anything about the gun debate, but, um, you, you know, you're almost just better off walking away because you never know who might have some type of firearm or something like that that's, that's going to end any situation like that, you know? Uh, no, that's a great statement, Townsend. I think that's a real mature way to look at things. Um, I, I think that, that MMA and, and that type of training has a, a way in our society and it's going to be a, a mainstay and it's going to offer a place of, of protection, um, maybe from uh, anti-bullying and that type of, of sentiment um, as kids are experiencing that. Um, so so I understand a lot of what you're saying there. And we could have a whole nother video on that, Townsend, but I want to shift and, and let you get back to your to your day uh, and talk about property management. You've given me some insight, some education, um, some, some clarity on some stuff when we look at property management and real estate investing, um, so to sure. speak, and more specifically. Tell me a little bit, though, about how you got into property management and why. And then I want to ask a little bit more about that. And then I'm going to let you run, brother. Sure, sure. So my wife's uh, father, you know, my father-in-law has uh, a few different properties. And so I was always intrigued by his success, you know. And so my opportunity came along when uh, my daughter actually was, was starting up at ASU. And most college universities now, they want your, you know, the freshmen to stay in the dorms, you know, and, and to the benefit, I think, you know, because there's a lot, um, there's a big lifestyle adjustment for most kids to, to be able to uh, transition into from high school into, into college. We felt that our daughter was um, was self-sufficient and she didn't necessarily need to stay in the dorms. And a lot of it came down to a financial situation, you know. And so um, when the opportunity arose, we, we found a condo and you know, I put my daughter in there and, and she's turned out to be a blessing in terms of being able to market the property and being able to find a lot of different renters, you know. And so we turned that property into uh, into a fixer upper, it took a lot of time and, and, and money and, and fixed it up. And, and now we can charge, you know, top dollar for its location. And uh, that transitioned over to another property, and then it kind of started to steamroll a little bit after that. So it's been a it's been a you know tremendous uh, journey, and and it's been a lot of fun, and, and uh, it's been something I really enjoy doing. What's something that we need to look out for when we're getting into maybe our first property? Is it location? Is it uh, the investment? Maybe not getting something too cheap that we have to put too much time and money into into working and sustaining. Um, tell me a little bit there of, of maybe some do's and don'ts or some best practices. Yeah, great, great point. I think, um, you, you know, you said it. I think like most real estate, it's location, 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 right? Um, I, I have a niche where I try to focus exclusively on, you know, ASU around the campus because I think there's always going to be a demand for renters that are uh, that are going to be wanting to go to school there. Um, I think if you, if you uh, you know, you're in too low of a rent district, then, you know, you're going to get what you, what you pay for, right? And so there's only so much you can do with a property if it's in a bad neighborhood for how much you can demand and, and uh, or charge for rent. And at the same time, if you're if you're too high end, then uh, people would rather buy than, than uh, go ahead and rent a piece of property. So you have to find that happy medium that, that's comfortable for you, and so uh, and, and really do your research and uh, and know exactly what your what your means are, what you're capable of, and uh, kind of run with that. Awesome, Townsend. As you get into property management and you find your first spot, how how important is it for you to have some handyman type aptitudes or that type of, of individual or people in your network to help you with getting the house moving, um, you know, knocking walls down, doing plumbing, doing flooring? Talk about that real quick. Yeah, great question. So it's, it's, I think it's vital. You know, um, there's only so much you can do. I'm like we talked about, I'm a little bit of a handyman myself. I worked at Home Depot for a few years especially when I was competing for the Olympic team. But um, there's only so much that, that I'll take on myself, too. And so having a slew of people that, that can really help maintain a property or, uh, you know, fix something if it's broken, then um, I think that's a, that's a huge asset. So I have a list of, of uh, people that I can always turn to for either water heaters or air conditioning or 
you know, tile flooring or whatever it is. Not that there's any job that, that I'm afraid to take on myself, but sometimes there's only so many hours in a day and you have to find that balance between, you know, is it worth paying somebody? Is it worth actually, you know, doing the work yourself? Excellent, Townsend, excellent. Um, tell me, you know, this is probably going to be my last question for you today. I'm going to let you run. Tell me what systems or CRM is helping you do with, with managing your leads, your, your, your rental properties, your, um, your renters. How, how is CRM and maybe automation, marketing automation, helping you uh, in, in your day-to-day? I know this is a side business, but how, yeah. how is it, how's it aiding you? Maybe it even yes. helps more because of that. Yeah. Great, great question. So not so much on the on the market automation side. Again, I think this is where my you know my daughter's really been a tremendous help. She's kind of a natural marketer. You know, from the time that she was in high school, she would she would find little uh, clothing items that she would um, she would piece together and sell on, on social media and stuff. And so I'm fortunate to have her on the CRM side. It's definitely vital. I think being able to pull up uh, a, you know a list of contractors that can help me with any given problem or being able to pull up uh, any different renter or somebody if I, if I have to communicate with them about um, any different thing that might come up. I can't tell you how often it's happened to me where I've been out of town and like an AC unit might have gone out, you know, and being able to, uh, to pull up a, a contractor from my database, from right from my mobile phone, from my CRM, and being able to, uh, you know, utilize them has been, a, it's been tremendous. I think if you don't have that, then you're just kind of almost like an amateur. You're just kind of hoping for things to kind of come around. Awesome, Towns, and great insights again, brother. Thank you for your time talking about your journey, talking about property management. I might lead on you again for another video. You could be the first person to do three. Um, I'm going to do a quick plug on you and, and, and everybody. I won't do this a lot, but I've been just really in love with the Titan Gravity Weight Suit. Um, it's got amazing abilities. These little silicone pads allow that weight to come in to take that training to the next level. I'm actually going to freeze a town and use it for some recovery today. Um, and some healing as it's going to offer some some nice nice cold to my muscles i'm a little sore but um titan's a great company townsend you're a great man a great wrestler a champion in my mind and a lot of other people's thank you for your time thank you for bringing the american flag into work and hanging that on your desk um you motivate me brother thank you so much for spending your mondays with the mako and giving back to this community awesome thank you shark you're great i appreciate all it. right cheers brother i'm gonna let you run um i'll see you soon thanks guys we're back in action trish next week Guys, thank you for spending your Mondays with the makeup.